So today we're going to look at plant diseases and defences against disease. Um, so some of this is going to be revision of stuff you have done as research and then there's going to be some application of knowledge activities for you to do during this lesson. So key things, recall the main plant diseases, explain how plant diseases affect plant growth and how to identify diseases and prevent their spread. And we're also going to look at mineral deficiencies that plants may suffer from and explain how we can spot those deficiencies and um, explain why the deficiency is causing the diseases within the plant. So, first little activity for you to do is just have a think what plant diseases can you remember from the research you did um, a few weeks ago. Have a think for just a minute or so. Okay, so you should be able to remember tobacco mosaic virus. Um, you can see the this sort of mottling of the leaves with this damage to the um, to the leaf to the chlorophyll um, caused by a virus. You've also got uh, rose black spot, which is a fungal disease. You can see the black discoloration of the leaf where the leaf's no longer green, it's lost its chlorophyll, and the leaves will eventually die and fall off. Now there are other diseases as well. Um, one of you might, you might not have made notes on, but you do need to be aware of, is infe insect infestation by aphids. Um, and they, the little aphids, they feed um, on the f sugars in the phloem um, in the plant. So you can find them sort of sucking on the stems or on the underside of leaves. Um, we call aphids green fly as well. You can see they're green. Also, you should know about Pseudomonas syringae, bacterial infection and crown gall disease, which is also a bacterial infection. These two, TMV and fungal black spot, are your main um, ones to make sure you really do know about. So how do they affect the plant? I'll give you two questions. Um, I'd like you to try and answer them as, in as much scientific detail as you can. Some of these you've seen before. So explain why both tob tob tobacco mosaic virus and rose black spot reduce the growth rate of plants they infect and give two ways that you might think that aphids might negatively affect the plants they feed on. This one might require you to think a little bit more. So just spend maybe three minutes, three, four minutes on this and then have a look at the answers on the next, in the next slides. Okay, so let's see how you did. So for the TMV and rose black spot, um, the key thing here is it's affecting photosynthesis. The whole point is the leaves are damaged, so there's going to be less chlorophyll, which means less light is going to be absorbed because there's less chlorophyll, which means the rate of photosynthesis will be lower, so you're going to make less glucose overall. And the key thing then is to make that link as to well, why does that affect growth. So you'll be thinking about, well, glucose need for respiration to release energy, make sure you have said release and not produce or anything else like that. Um, and that energy will be needed for cell division and for also making big molecules within the plant to make new cells with. Equally, the glucose you make in photosynthesis is not just using respiration, it's used to make all the other organic molecules. It's the basis of them all, if you like. The, the building blocks we're going to use and break up and rearrange to make things like proteins um, and also things like cellulose for cell walls. Um, so that the plant can grow. So converting into other molecules is a really important idea that you need to be aware of and we'll come back to when we do bioenergetics. Let's think about the aphids then. Well the key thing is the aphids are feeding on the sugars, the sucrose, it's the sugar that's transported in phloem. So that means if they're feeding on it, the plants made those sugars in photosynthesis, so there's going to be less sugars available for the plant, so again less glucose available for respiration to release energy for cell division etc and to make proteins and cellulose cell walls and all those things which means we're going to have a slower rate of growth and also the way that they feed is it's like a mosquito they have a little stylet um, so in other words they're injecting their proboscis the stylet through the physical barriers of the um, of the plant in the same way as a mosquito would be getting past your physical barriers in your body and that means that other pathogens can get in. So TMV, bacterial infections, fungal infections might be able to get into the plant in that way. And that's obviously going to have a negative effect of linking back to question one. So 
that is a little bit of recall, a little bit of thinking that you might have had to do. Okay, so now we're going to look at how we can spot plant diseases. I'm going to talk you through all the different ways you can spot plant diseases and then you can make a few notes. So, spotting plant diseases. Key things you're going to look for is the plant's not growing properly, stunted growth. The leaves might have spots on them like that rose black spot. They might actually be rotting and decaying and bits falling apart. They might have lumps or growths coming from them like crown gall disease creating a huge growth on the side of the trunks of trees. The leaves or stems might be malformed and that's a key thing you can look for is your normally smooth leaves or whatever or wrinkled up and damaged. You may well get some discoloration of the leaves um, or other parts of the plant so that doesn't look correct. Um, and you might actually be able to see the pest there. So you'll be able to see the aphids or other insects, um, pests and things actually feeding on the plant and damaging it. So other things you might be asked in the exam is you might be asked to identify the causes. Well, it's quite difficult for you to do that unless you've got a gardening manual or a website which you can look up to find out what it looks like. Um, and you can actually get them analysed in the laboratory um, and they can use things like monoclonal antibodies and things like that to test for key pathogens because they'll have monoclonal antibodies against the um, antigens of those pathogens. Um, but obviously that's not something someone in your own garden might do, but in a, in a growers, in a commercial growers, they may well want to do that. How do we stop the spread? Hopefully you pick these ideas up from um, your research, but the key thing is if it's a bacterial infection, you might use a bactericidal spray, um, or some sort of antimicrobial chemical. If it's a fungal infection like rose black spot, you'd use a fungicide. Key thing is you need to collect and destroy the contaminated plant material so it's not going to put any spores or bacteria or viruses into the soil that can infect other plants. Um, so you want to burn it and destroy it. And also you should disinfect your things like your secateurs and spades and trowels and all those sorts of things after they've been used. So just take a couple of minutes now just to make a few notes or add to any notes that you made previously um, when you were doing the diseases section. Okay, the next task I want you to do is to actually use your textbooks, so page 104 and 106 um, in your textbook and also maybe access the Caboodle site because it's got a, quite a nice section in the textbook there, pages 92 to 95 and look at the plant defences against infection. Don't write a lot, really clear summary is absolutely fine. Take about 20 minutes to do this and you need to look at whether they're physical barriers, chemical barriers or defences against herbivores, so preventing herbivores coming on and eating um, the plant. A um, bit similar to what we had for our barriers for humans. Um, so key things you need to include are cellulose cell walls, Mimicry, the waxy cuticle, antimicrobial compounds, think about things like tea tree oil, thorns, layers of dead cells in the bark, um, leaf drop, producing poisonous chemicals, hairy stems and leaves, and things called leaf car. So you should be able to find out about all of those using the textbooks. Um, an example of the level of detail, just to make life simple. So an example of chemical defense would be poisonous chemicals. Um, which if herbivores eat the plant will make them unwell, hopefully it won't kill them, it might, but the key thing is it will deter them from eating the plant. Usually they, they learn and in some cases it becomes innate, um, in other words they don't have to learn it, they just know not to eat things. So for example deadly nightshade, which is a very pretty plant, is very poisonous if it's eaten. So take 20 minutes on that now and then come back to the presentation. Okay, final thing we're going to look at today is this idea of deficiency diseases in plants. So there are a number of different um, minerals that can lead to deficiency diseases in plants. You only need to know about two of them, but there's lots of other mineral ions such as um, potassium and phosphate ions and all those sorts of ions that are really important for plant growth. Um, but you only need to know about two and they are nitrogen or nitrate ions which is what would be in the soil nitrogen's in the air and plants can't use that out straight out there they have to use nitrates that are in the soil um, and a key symptom of that is 
um, stunted growth. Okay, so you can see here, these are some wheat plants, I think, or some sort of grass. This is a plant with enough nitrates. This one here has got no nitrates in the growth medium at all. So it's only grown from seedlings with just the food that was available in the seed. And you can see much smaller and actually some of the leaves are already dying off. Um, to try and keep the new younger leaves healthy so they're reabsorbing, breaking down the stuff there. But the key thing is stunted growth, it's not going to grow at all. And then you've got a lack of magnesium. Okay, the key thing with magnesium is there's something called chlorosis, which is pale yellow leaves and a slower rate of growth. So you can see here, this plant here has got yellow leaves, um, not enough chlorophyll being made. Okay. So what I want you to do is try and explain why those um, minerals being deficient from the soil would lead to those diseases. There's some key points below to help you. Okay, so nitrates are absorbed from the soil. We talked about that already, and obviously by active transport. And because photosynthesis only makes compounds with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it, think about you know glucose, just C6H12O6. Um, so Amino acids, importantly in making proteins, um, also contain nitrogen, which would have to come from the nitrate. And magnesium's are, magnesium ions also come from the soil, um, and they're, they're needed to make chlorophyll. So, have a think, try and come up with a little explanation again as to why we'd have stunted growth for nitrate um, deficiency and slow growth and chlorosis for magnesium ion deficiency. Shouldn't take you too long, give yourself five minutes to do it. So let's see how you did. So for nitrate deficiency, we've got this stunted growth. So key thing is the lack of nitrate in the soil means we're going to absorb fewer nitrates by active transport from the soil. That means because we need nitrates to make amino acids, we're going to make fewer amino acids, which means less protein can be produced. Remember that's happened on the ribosomes. Because proteins needed for growth and making new cells and making enzymes and all those sorts of things that proteins needed for, there's going to be less or slower growth. And then for our chlorosis, the key thing here is less magnesium is going to be absorbed, which means less chlorophyll is going to be made, so the leaves are going to appear yellow instead of green. Because there's less chlorophyll, there's going to be less light absorbed, so there's going to be a lower rate of photosynthesis and therefore less glucose available for respiration to release energy for cell division and making cell walls and making proteins etc and also less glucose actually available to make those large molecules like proteins and cellulose etc and therefore slower growth so we've got two things in this answer here we've got chlorosis and slow growth so the yellow color is because of the lack of chlorophyll so it's not green and then actually very similar to the reason why plants grow slowly when they're leaves are damaged by pathogens, we've got a similar reason for the slow growth here. Hopefully you picked up quite a few of those, those points. Okay, little um, plenary activity for you to um, have a go at now and think about extending your understanding. So here we've got a graph showing um, nitrate levels in a field and concentration, so I just put arbitrary units here since there is a real number underneath, but um, we're just going to keep it simple. Um, and then a, a relative yield, ignore the 120%, you can't have more than 100%. So that's what the graph is showing you. Have a think about these questions. So describe the effect of increasing nitrate level on the yield. Well, we can see here it increases. But actually, eventually, it starts to level off. The way this graph's been drawn looks like it's a curve going down, but basically, as you increase, it increases, increases, sort of almost linear. And then once we get sort of about 80 units, the rate of increase is slowing down, slowing down, and eventually it plateaus and there's no real further increase. So we've got to maximum yield here. So a farmer's field has a nitrogen level of 40 units. They decided to add fertilise the field to increase the nitrate concentration to 200 units. Suggest why this would not be a sensible approach to take. So again, have a think. Pause the video for a moment. Okay, so key thing here is, well, 
you don't get any higher yield above 120 units roughly and in fact actually there's some plants here that are giving 100% yield even only on 40 which is a slight outlier might be an anomaly but key thing here 120 arbitrary units of nitrates no further increase in yield this would suggest there'll be a complete waste of money remember adding fertilizer to your field is going to cost you money so they'd be wasting um, wasting uh, money on putting fertilizer on the field and not getting any extra yield so you're going to lose um, lose profit you make the profit margins between um, what you know how much you can sell your crop for and how much it's cost you to produce the crop in the first place okay another thing is this environmentally this becomes bad because what happens if you have too many nitrates is they can just wash off the field they dissolve in water and end up in the river and that causes all sorts of um, problems with um, something called eutrophication which you'll find out about in your lab. Another farm suggested that the best level to increase nitrate concentration to be only be 80. Suggest why this might be sensible. So have another think. Key thing is here, remember the graph started to level off. So what we've got here is you're having to add quite a lot more fertilizer to only get a small increase in yield. So you're having to add quite a lot more fertilizer and you're only getting a small increase in yield. And the key thing here is this probably becomes unprofitable to try and get this last little bit of yield out you're probably spending more money than you will gain in um, in extra yield and therefore your profit margin is going to go down so it's not cost effective to do that which is why quite often though farmers will not put as much nitrate on as they possibly could to get the maximum yield because it's just a cost benefit analysis last question um, explain why farmers have to keep adding fertilizers to their fields year after year have a little think. The key reason is going to be what they're doing every year is the crop that they're producing, they're harvesting and taking off the field. And all those minerals, all the nitrates and all the other mineral ions that have been taken out of the soil have been locked up in the compounds in the yield, in the crop. So when they take that away, it's not being returned to the soil um, by the plant dying and decomposing, it's being taken away. So the farmer has to keep adding nitrates and other mineral ions to the soil regularly. That could be through artificial fertilizers, or it could be through using manure or something like that, or even um, planting certain plants that have bacteria that live in their roots that can take nitrogen from the air, which you might want to find out about. They're called nitrogen fixing bacteria. Okay, hopefully that's helped you through some of the um, plant diseases topic, and we've just about come to the end of the um, microbes and disease topic now. Thank you.